Your arms are enormous. <laughs> Once upon a time, I had muscles worth showing. <laughs> I've known you for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that to other people and they believe me. I've been, I've been really big. Yeah. Like fat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not to brag. <laughs> Hey guys, what's up? Matt here. Welcome to another episode of Coffees for Closers. Today, what we are going to be going over is a, a little bit more advanced uh, from our previous Sales 101. I think we'll call it something novel like Sales 102. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be going a little bit into some of the sort of reframes and I guess psychology of a sale rather than just the straight mechanisms. So if that's going to be helpful to you, if you're a business owner or a sales guy that wants to make more money, grow your business, stick around and we'll see you after the intro. If you listen to this podcast, you will make your first million within three years. We're here to make podcasts. You really want this. You listen and review. All right. Um, Okay. So in Sales 101, I think what we went over was sort of the basic outline of a sale. So Mm -hmm. the phases of like any peaky phases, right? So going through from start to finish, what you're trying to do. So then what you've got... That's sort of the the foundational layers mm-hmm. and like the mechanics. But then you've got the emotional tides that you're trying to create to build enough urgency to get someone to actually buy something. Okay. Because you can sort of, you can say all the right things, but if you don't say them in the right way, then they're probably not going to, it's probably not going to invoke the right level of emotion at the right time. Okay. You know? You know, I'm sure you, my, my wife has told me many times, it's not what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. She probably told you that. Uh, <laughs> right? So, so uh, there, there's some important distinctions. So in those beginning phases, whether it be like those kind of connecting phases, like y- you want to have, there's this big saying like, you know, detach from the sale, detach from the outcome and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And it's a very difficult thing to do because I think that people are always like, yeah, but I want to make the sale and I want to get the comms. And it's like, it's not like I don't want to get the commission. It's like, well, yeah, man, but like that's a different thing entirely. Mm-hmm. And so uh, you still want to get the outcome. Like you had the 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 baby trainer that mm-hmm. come in, right? The the sort of sleep trainer. She's a, she's detached, yeah, from that a little bit more emotionally. Yeah, so she's able to look at things more objectively and sort of go, oh, okay, this is what's happening instead of like just having a freak out like like we all do. Mm-hmm. And so what we want to do is the goal of selling. And the goal of being a good salesperson should not be like, I need to make a sale on every sale. It should be that you do the process, which gives you the chance to make the sale. Mm-hmm. And so and, then... And, and if the sale can be made, the process will allow for that. Exactly. Okay. So if, if you're thinking like the only way to determine whether or not you did a good job as a sale, like what if the person just doesn't have the money and you did everything perfectly? Mm-hmm. And if, if you were to replicate that a hundred times, if 60, oh. 60 of those are a win... The 40 of those are not a loss. It's just the fact that it just didn't work out that way. Mm-hmm. And so what helped me, if if, if I may be so bold, mm-hmm. ascend to the next <laughs> plane. <laughs> what slingshotted you to success? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what enabled me to not be so angry mm-hmm. when I was selling? Because I used to go like, ah, they didn't buy something from me and I just met them. Mm-hmm. Um was like not worrying about it mm-hmm. and so and at I, what point did you uh were you able to do that was that something that you learned when you came into the high ticket stuff or were you able to emotionally detach even when you were the gym owner and you were selling your own product no i was so angry yeah angriest human being on the planet yeah i was like the hulk of sales just less mm-hmm. green and fatter <laughs> <laughs> just a sloppy hulk yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. yeah that was actually my nickname in high school <laughs> so um it wasn't until much later that you actually could do that. And it's something that you learned from Jeremy or? No, it's, it's not that I learned it from Jeremy. I learned it from having a process that I was confident. In. Okay. So I think one of the things that I see a lot of times in sales is dudes will like, they'll do something and it will work and then it won't work twice. And they go like, well, everything I've done previously is garbage. So yeah, I might as well yeah. throw it out the window. Yeah, yeah. And that's pretty standard for everything in life. Um, and so as soon as I was like, oh, okay, like, I can't sell everybody. Mm-hmm. So there is no process I can do in which will allow me to do that. So all I can do is the process that I'm confident in, which works X amount of time. So even if it was like 20% of the time, that's two out of 10. Mm-hmm. So if I like being frustrated at the inevitability of not selling those eight is insane. Now I was 
fully blown insane there for a while. Like I literally punched a hole through a door after not making a sale one time because I had like three no shows in a row and then like a no sale and a no sale and then a fucking guy ghosts me and I was like, rah, mm. buff, buff, you know, um, punched through a solid court door. No, I didn't. Um, Big but, emotional man baby <laughs> came you, out. And you started. can imagine <laughs> <if> I did. <laughs> um, and so, but that was because like I was constantly changing my process mm -hmm. and I was being reactive to the things that were coming at me. Mm -hmm. And it's just not a, a good way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, and, but it's because I'd never been taught anything. I was completely self-learned and I was pretty good at it, but I was only good at it because I was relentless. Mm -hmm. it, it was just, that was really it. It was lots of objection handling and just doing a lot. Sorry, I got the flu shot. That's why I'm not feeling that sure good. Sure you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did too. Yeah? I got a, I got a sticker there. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah, mine's the same, but just... Just bigger. Much thicker. <laughs> Yeah, my wolf's bigger than yours. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not the size, it's what you do. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's the size. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you just got to do less with it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, it's, but as soon as I, I came into Jeremy's fold, like, I had someone that I could go, that worked for them, and mm -hmm. there is a specific way to do it. And so, once I, like, go, oh, okay, like, it was like shooting. You know, um, like when I was in sniper course, they were like, shoot this way. And I was like, okay. Because I'd never shot before the military. Mm. So I only learned how to shoot army style. So I was always a pretty decent shot. And then when I went into sniping, it was like the same way of shooting, just a little bit more refined. Yeah, yeah. And so I was good at it. I was like, oh, sweet. But the guys who had grown up on farms, they, they, they would always reach this point where they could never get any better. Yeah. Because they had all these bad habits, which were almost impossible to take out because they thought they knew better because they'd achieved some success with it. Mm -hmm. And so um, by, by, by following that process, and I remember when I, was, when I was shooting, like I had this real methodical way of like calming myself down, taking myself through the process, feeling it from my feet all the way up into my fingers and then mm -hmm. like at the same time every time. You know, like with my heartbeat rhythm and with my breathing rhythm. So it was the exact same. So like, would I make every shot? Like, no, of course not. <laughs> like, there are a lot of variables, you know, but I was always in a good position and I was always consistent enough to reduce the variables as much as possible. Yep. And so like having learned and had success with that way, I guess like when I went into sales, as soon as I saw someone that was able to have a methodology that was replicatable, I was like, oh, okay. Like I can now start to apply all the the styles of learning that I've had prior to this. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to ask then. Like you learned the process, learn that from Jeremy or the fact that there is a process, right? Yeah. But for somebody who you know, doesn't, they're selling whatever it is they sell and they're like, how big a sample pool should you take before you do test and adjust? You know, so like mm. keep with your shooting analogy, you, you never test and adjust off less than three rounds, right? Because you don't, there is no average with only two rounds in shooting. And so like how many calls would you encounter on a particular product of a particular service, whatever, before you go, this process isn't working, I need to change it? I would do at least like 15. Okay. Like, because, because there are like... With shooting, you can take it down to very specific variables and you can mm -hmm. isolate many things. That mm -hmm. um, like you can do a ball and dummy shoot and you mm -hmm. can see a lot, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to do that in sales and you're dealing with humans that are like very difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. So they're easy to do predict. They're easy to say that they're going to be unpredictable. So like you have so many more variables. So you need to have like a gambit of people and then you, you've got to do basically the identical process for everybody as best you can, but there's always going to be variation because you're talking to a person. Yeah. Like, we couldn't replicate this conversation. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know? yeah. So, um, and neither could you. So. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so you got to give yourself a good amount of time. And then the thing that people fuck up is that they go, well, it didn't work, so I'm going to change everything. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, now, like now you can't tell anything. Mm -hmm. So, one thing that I think I did particularly well was, like, the isolating of variables. Mm -hmm. And so, I would, I would do my process, and I, I was very careful to not, fuck with anything that was working like when i before i was selling in the napq methodology like i had a good close rate like it was very high like it was above 60 mm -hmm. and so like i was like i'm not messing with that but everything before that was a disaster so i decided to only use the napq stuff before that okay because i was like well it can't get worse yep 
like I'm inducing no shows and I'm getting ghosted and all this stuff's happening before I get here. But anyone who I get on the phone with, like I'm banging it until they until they buy. Okay. Now I had a pretty decent refund right off the back end. Like one in five would just refund like 20 minutes after the call. <laughs> yeah, right. Because <laughs> right. I was saying some fucking mean things. Yeah, so if you notice that as a pattern, that's you just like inducing some sort of sort of learned helplessness of the person where they're like, this is inevitable. I'll say I'll buy in oh, order take to the just money get off the phone. Take yeah. the money. Like it, I, was, I was boxing people in to like just logistical traps where mm. you look like an idiot. Mm. To not buy. What do you think happens when that person hangs up the phone from you and they've just <laughs> like unwillingly yeah. handed over their credit card details and run a charge? Well, it's a strange thing because we're just on a phone call. Yeah. Like you can just hang up. <laughs> it yeah. does sound like you can't, you can't. Like that's what was strange to me because like that couldn't happen to me. Yeah. You know, like I would just be like, oh no, this is stupid. Yeah. Like stop it. And I'd hang up the phone. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. But people are so adverse to conflict that they would rather... Mm. like have someone charge $5,000 to their credit card, sign a document and then just <laughs> call their credit card company and send an FYI email. Hey, I'm out. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. this could have been sorted with a phone call. Yeah. Um, or just, oh, I'm going into a tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I've had people do like 14 numbers on their credit card. Like that. <laughs> the best I've ever seen is a bit of a side. I was actually reviewing a, a sales call of a guy who I was coaching. And he gets this guy real good, right? <laughs> this guy <laughs> is in a tiny little box like that. He's like, yeah, it sounds good. I'm just going to go get my credit card. He's on Zoom. And he leaves the Zoom. And then you just see an arm come in over the webcam <laughs> like that, and end the chat. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, he's like, how do I stop that? I was like, oh, I don't know, man. Like, You can't. You can't. Like, that's always going to happen. Even if you're like the most neutral, you know, cool guy out there. Like, there will be people who are just incapable of having any level of confrontation, which is like, hey, no, I don't know if this is right for me. Mm -hmm. You know, or like they've big nerded themselves and they've lied about income or they, you know, stuff yeah. like that. And so then they're in a, a box where it's like, well, you've told me this, 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 and this, and now you're doing this, which doesn't make any sense here. Mm. So what's happening? Mm. And then when you call people on that, they don't know what to do mm. because people are very rarely in a day-to-day -day context called on obvious lies. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that just this morning, right? So my car's down at, uh, so he's getting f fixed. Yeah, stupid radio thing broke on it. But uh, I was kind of reliving the day I bought it and it, there was some issues getting finance. It was a paperwork issue. And so I said, oh, fuck it, I'll just buy it, right? And didn't do that. <laughs> and the chick kind of looked at me weird and um, because they want to know all your financial info. And I was like, oh, we'll use this account. And she's like, you didn't tell me about that account. And I was like, I'm not like going to tell you where all my money is. Yeah. Like I gave you enough information for you to uh, know that I'm not at risk, um, but I'm not giving you everything. And she was shocked and she was like, it usually goes the other way. Usually people say too much and they don't actually have it. And I, it made me think about this exact situation. Like how many people big note themselves and kind of lie about their income and what they're doing and, you know, like their, their success and you, you, you know, and I'm sure we've talked about this before, that you genuinely go, oh, this is the right product for you. Like I'm yeah. selling you into this because given the information that you've given me, and they're good at presenting the bullshit because they've presented it plenty of times. So you don't catch them in any of the lies. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, but there's none of that's true. So I don't actually have any of the money. Yeah. So there's a way around that. Yeah. And I discovered that when I was selling. So I would get that all the time because I was talking with tradies all the time and they would sort of big nut themselves. And then when it came down to it, I was like, oh, like... And, and sometimes it's a case of like they haven't thought about it so like they say things but they're working on gross figures but the nets are terrible like i had guys who were making 20 million dollars a year but they were netting like a hundred yeah like terrible business owners they yeah, just yeah. have no idea what they're doing um and so what i started doing is i started asking all the questions out of order yeah so i really when i really honed that in with salespeople. Okay. Right. When I was selling like any PQ and stuff like that, I was like, okay, so what I need to figure out is how much money they're making and how mm -hmm. much money they want to make so I can establish that gap. Cause that gap is an important thing for me to get. Okay. Now it's only an initial gap. I'll stretch that gap later if need be, because I have to have like a stretch goal. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like yeah, it can't yeah, be yeah, like yeah. they're at 10 K a month. They want to get to 12. Like that's not, yeah, yeah. It, it's hard for me to leverage that. But like a lot of people, especially with like commission only work, like they think they're making more money than they are. Okay. And so what I'll do is I'll go like, okay, what's the sales process that you use? They go, I use triage and sales call. I go, okay, cool. How many sales calls do you take? Do you, how many, like how many sales calls do you take per week? 
And they go, I take 20. And I go, cool. How many triages show up? And they go, 40. Okay, cool. And then I go, how many sales calls do you book? And they'll go this, you know what I mean? And they'll go, 30. And I'm like, okay, cool. So they take 20. And how many sales do you make? And they go, seven. Like uh, that. And so and then I'll go back up and like, okay, and how many leads do okay. you get? And then I'll be like, okay, and how much do you make per sale? And they go, this many. And then I go, and, and what's your current? And, and then I'll go, and then like, and what's your like goal revenue? They go, uh, 12. And I go, and what's your current? They go, eight. And I go, but. I go, but you make $1,000 a sale and you only make four a week. Mm-hmm. I go, so what's going on there? And they're like, oh, oh yeah, I guess I hadn't thought of that. Right. Right. So yeah, I'm making this. I'm like, okay, cool. Like that. So I can ask. So you'd be confident order. that you, you always have a, a, a true representation of these days, yeah. wealth and capability on the call. Yeah. Cause I'll ask it so quick. Because mm-hmm. I know what I need to do. I go, this, 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 that. And you ask it really quick. And I like, I'm very staccato with the voice. This, mm. this, 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 this. That this. would be an interesting thing. I think if you're, if you're watching, let us know if that, like, do you have a, you have an actual flow chart that you follow on that? That's a real thing. Yeah, yeah, especially for like for certain. So for all the accounts that we use, like we have the specific administrative questions that we need to get to. Mm-hmm. So you have an end end question, and then you have like, how do we get to the end question? Yeah, because like you, if you do it in order, it it's too easy to lie. Let us know if you want to make a special video on that with that as a handout. Put it in the comments. Cool. Comment down cool. below. Comment down below. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so because if you do it, if you do it in order, like okay, how many sales, how many, how many leads do you get? How many of those leads convert into triage? What's your triage show up rate? How many of those go to a sales call? How many sales calls booked? How many sales calls show up? What do you make per sale? What's your income? Mm-hmm. It's so easy just to go that you do it out of order. It fucks people up, mm-hmm. and that became especially good when I was talking like selling Sales Sniper as a service. Mm-hmm. It's like I would just go all over the space over like twenty minutes of calls. I would ask them all these random questions, and I would just write down all the answers. Mm-hmm. And then I would, then I would have like how many leads, how many triages, how many this, how many this, how much money, how many uh, like that, and everything. And then I'd be like, so how much money are you guys making? Like oh, 150 a month. And I go, how? Yeah, doesn't that up? And they go, you're uh, a side hustle, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, adorable. Um, so I'd be like, but how? Because you're only making this many sales. Mm-hmm. You have this much back end revenue. This much front end can be done from that sales. Like, wh- where's the other money coming from? Mm-hmm. So they go, oh, well, we did 150 once at one time. Like, you yeah, could imagine we, if we did that, imagine. right? <laughs> so it, yeah, it's a really important step to learn how to take as to how to ask those random questions okay. to get to the real goal. Yep. So kind of going back to the, that sort of detachment. Mm. That's, a, that's a nice long tangent there. That's how podcasts work, mate. It's yeah. just two dudes waffling bullshit going yeah. around in circles. Yeah. As long as we find our way back. As the only one happy. said, you signed up to us. We didn't sign up to you. <laughs> <laughs> no one's making you watch this. All right. So um, keep watching. That, <laughs> that detachment comes from having a process that you're super confident in. So I can explain my process. I can say yeah. why, and I know why it works and how it works. So that allows me to go, like, even if I didn't get the sale, I can go, oh, it's a good call. Mm-hmm. So that was always my goal was, like, and one of the benefits that I have was that, like, you know, the old saying, there's no such thing as a coward in front of a camera. Mm-hmm. When I was doing all my sales, like, I had Marco below me, and Marco is an animal for learning, and he would listen to every single call I did mm-hmm. because he was trying to learn off me. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> and so, and because I like to remind him every time I see him, when I first met you, motherfucker, you were selling ninety-seven dollar fitness programs, making fucking forty-five k a year, <laughs> while he's wearing a ten thousand dollar pair of shoes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, you were nothing without me. <laughs> I like to remind him that on a daily basis. I just call him randomly. <laughs> you were nothing without me. <laughs> oh my god, what have you done? Oh, that's, the, that's the ghost of Marco. <laughs> um, no, so he was just like relentlessly listening to everything. So. Yeah. And so was Road and Will and all these guys that came in like sort of foundational to the sort of sniper community was like, I, I had to do everything. Mm. Like I couldn't take a call off or I couldn't cut a corner because I knew every single call was being yep. watched. And then so that made me good at objection handling because like I wasn't going to not objection handle because they would be like, oh, you didn't even fucking try. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes you just can't be fucked. You don't want to do stuff, but I had to. So it meant that I got in a habit of every single call. Yep. being like it needed to be an example of who I was as a salesperson. Yeah. So then it, it sort of, it put me in a good spot to where I was like, oh, this just became how I did things. Mm-hmm. And then everyone had access to my close IO so they could see how many follow-ups and referrals and outbound I was doing. So I just had to do everything because I needed to be the example to bring everybody else up so I could eventually stop fucking doing it. Yeah. 
you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so me having the confidence in my process and me just having, instead of my goal being to make the sale, my goal was to do my thing. Mm -hmm. And then the better I got at doing my thing, the more my numbers came up. Mm -hmm. And so when I was first starting, let's say it was like 30% was good. So I was happy with three out of 10. Like, why wouldn't I be? Yeah. Like you wouldn't walk into a gym and put 200 kilos in the bar and try and bench it and then be like, oh, I should be able to do this. It's like, mm -hmm. you have not done the work to mm -hmm. be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So why be frustrated? Mm -hmm. um, and then it was like four out of 10 and five out of 10 and six out of 10. Then I was consistently doing about eight out of 10. Okay. And so I knew that the two that I didn't get was like, oh. Couldn't be gotten. I just, yeah. Or at least like in, in, in someone might've been able to get that. But then they wouldn't have got those other two that I got. Sure, yeah. You know, like it's it's there's there's a there's a puzzle. Every sales call is a puzzle, and you just got to put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that like you'll always ask the right questions to always get it. But as long as you're like consistently getting the puzzles right, then who who cares about the ones that you don't? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. You know, and so when I got that level of like detachment, and that's what I consider detachment. Like I have a want to make the sale. I care about the person making the right decision for themselves. So like if if they have a, a constant and persistent like lack of moving forward on things, like procrastination, like then it's not in that best person's interest to just think about it. Yeah. You know, the fat guy is never just going to magically eat healthy and go to the gym. Like mm -hmm. someone's going to have to put the hard work on that dude and make him do it. Mm -hmm. You know, or the doctor tells him he's going to die or there's some sort of a, a triggering event that causes action. Sure. My goal was to be the triggering event that causes action. Mm -hmm. And so as long as I was putting in that effort, doing my thing, then I was pretty happy with whatever outcome happened. And I used to like share sales calls and I'm pretty sure I've sailed a number of no sales, but I was like, dude, I threw the fucking kitchen sink at that dude. Like yeah. I'm not Tony Robbins. I'm not going to spend three hours doing an intervention with someone who was either loved too much or not enough by their daddy. Mm -hmm. That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. I got an hour with this person. I'll do the best I can. Mm -hmm. So once I had that, it became way easier. I became more relaxed. And then that made my close rate better. Because people could tell I wasn't after the sale. I was just kind of doing my thing. Yeah. And I became yeah. so confident in the process that I trusted the process, so I always did it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for me to take away from that is the process is key, but it, it's not just the the success metric of like, yeah, I followed my process. What it, you get from it is the emotional detachment and that you know, has like a carryover effect into everything else on the sales call. Yeah, right? like your your whole demeanor will change when you just follow the process rather than chase the sale. But and oh, yeah. it's the process's job to get the sale if the sale can be got. Yeah, and you just follow the process. Don't get too worked up. There's a couple of big things that happen. First of all, your objection handling is not a, is not um, combative. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like you can hear the frustration in the salesperson's voice, and that if, as soon as someone comes off as frustrated, like that, it's gone. You mm -hmm. can't get that back because like. What right do I have to be frustrated at you after 30 minutes not giving me 30 grand? Yeah. Like, it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Like, let's be yeah. honest. Yeah. So coming at it from an angle of frustration is immediately going to change the context of everything that person tells you. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, oh, this guy is really trying to push me here. Mm -hmm. But if I'm like, oh, hey, man, like, I totally understand that. Like, you know, like, are you open to looking at things from a different perspective? So we can, you know, it's like a, there's a tonality behind it, which is lighthearted. It's uh, inquisitive and interested you know, and sort of somewhat challenging, but in a really like, hey, like, let's look at things in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm, I'm trying to walk you through a pathway instead of going like, well, dude, like, fuck, man, like, you said you made a million dollars, like, you know, like, so. It Do you have, have you ever caught anyone like that and then sort of shown them a lot of empathy for like, has that ever turned into a sale when someone, when those numbers that you take don't add up and then you go like, oh, man, would you, you'd like to actually be doing that though, right? Like. Yeah. Imagine not having to lie about that. Yeah. I, it's one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that I tell sales guys all the time is, and it's sort of, I think, antithetical to a lot of the sales industry, is the best thing about being a sales guy is you never have to lie to anyone. Mm -hmm. So you can be like, you're the truth guy. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, oh, well, that's, you said that's blue, but it's red. <laughs> <laughs> and you get, you get to be that guy. Yeah. But like, you have to do that in the right way. Yeah. And so, like, if there's a true anomaly, I'll go, but uh, help me understand, man. Like, okay. That doesn't make any sense to me. And sometimes they go, oh, fuck. Like, I've fucked up. Mm -hmm. Like, I had a guy, I think it was a while ago, he wanted to be a sales sniper client. And he'd like, hey, I've mapped out all the numbers that I need to make this work. And I was like, those don't make any sense. 
He was like, what do you mean? He's like, this is what I've modeled my entire business off. And I go, I, sorry, dude, you've modeled your business completely incorrectly and your pricing is never going to work. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I can't, I can't. And he'd forgotten like a step in the process. Mm-hmm. He'd forgotten a step in the sales process where there is like a disqualification, which he has in his process. Mm-hmm. But he had like, he'd omitted it, which dramatically changed everything. Like in none of his spreadsheets, then you saw everything he put added in one thing and then everyone went at that and it was all negative. Mm. And I was like, sorry, dude, like that's reality. Yeah. He's like, well, I can't make that work. I go, but that's reality. Yeah, yeah. Like this is the way it is, man. And you have the metric, you can see it. You just hadn't added it in. So, you know, and again, that's because I don't care about making the sale. Like, it's not going to make sense if it's not going to make sense. Yeah. You know, um, but I really like uh, giving people the chance to like, you know, in a very productive way, kind of be the mirror. And be Like, my job here is not to make a sale. It's not to be a friend. My job is here to see if what we do works. But in order to know if it's going to work, like, I have to know the full picture. Mm-hmm. Because I can't sign someone up ethically to a program if I don't have the right ideas to what's going on yeah because i have the skill of manipulation so i I, there's like a with great power pat comes great responsibility no i like good joke but i get that i fully understand because you can that's why i was asking about the refunds before like where you can you can force a square peg through a round hole yeah but then when you're not there there's a risk that you have then sent someone down a path that isn't the right one for them and they, they do their money. Because like, like, I think especially in some of the coaching products and stuff like that, like if people just don't have the motivation, like if you're too scared to say no to you, like yeah. if, in person, you're not going to do well on those courses. Yep. And so there's that risk, right? But then there, you know, there's that risk of like, you, you don't know the path that you're sending someone down that, they're happy to walk while holding your hand. And then you're like, when, bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, good luck going alone. This is where I leave you. Yeah. What? Yeah. I thought we would be friends forever. Yeah. I thought, I thought after this sales call, me and you were best buddies. Yeah. And th- that's, a, that's one of the things about sales, especially when you're selling coaching is like, you have to be careful not to become the guy. Mm. And if you're really good at sales, it's actually kind of hard not to. Yeah. Um, because like they trust you so much. Like I felt like, you know, you're really good at sales and prospects go, what do you think I should do? Yeah, right. Right? I mean, like, Marco gets that all the time. Because Marco is, like, the most empathetic salesperson I've ever seen. Really? Yeah, he, he sells with a level of elegance and emotion that I've never seen before. Wow, okay. It's, it's, an, inre- it's an unreplicatable process. Mm-hmm. It's just, an hit, like, a hybrid of everything that he's learned, of my stuff, Jeremy's stuff. It's his stuff. T- Tony, yeah, it's his stuff, right? Um, mine is far more, like, stoic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, mine leads me to be able to do probably a lot more calls with a higher volume and like not be affected by it. Sure. He would be affected by a lot of calls. Okay. Because he goes so deep in the weeds of people, right? Um, but he gets all the time, well, I'm not sure, man. Like, what do you think I should do? He's like, I think you should buy it. <laughs> 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 you know, and they're like, okay. You know, and they're yeah. like, but at that, point, two. at that point, they're like, a, they're a baby bird, man. Yeah. Like, so being able to take someone through that process in 40 minutes yeah. from never meeting someone to have someone going like, what do you think I should do with my life? It's lucky like that mother nature doesn't hand that skill out to many people that are nefarious or bad actors. Well, I think it, I think it does. No, nah, <laughs> I think like there's certainly some, Yeah, but I think, could you imagine if like, cause you know, most dickheads you see, you can pick it. You see them and you're, ah, oh, you're a dickhead. Like yeah, that's from true. the jump. Yeah. yeah. But you, every now and again, you get someone that can be that and, is is a bad actor. Yeah, yeah. We think of someone like Tony Robbins who's like just so influential and they're mm. so big. Mm. And that's the thing. So like one of the things about, because I know Eli who has talked about Tony Robbins, he's like, he's so big. And his hands are huge and he puts his hands on you and he feels like your dad when you're a kid. Yeah. And so like it takes you back to like a hand covering your entire chest. Yeah. And like that's a level of like, you can just do that because he does that all the time. He puts hand on the back, hand on the chest and speaks to them like this far away. And they're just, he's six foot six. Yeah. Like, like a big like that. Thanos type character. Yeah, he really is. Big fucking giant jaw from what the growth hormone he's done, I'm sure. Right? <laughs> so he's going to live forever. He's going to live forever. Not on my high level of income <laughs> advances the modern science. I'd be like 275, <laughs> 280. He will. I got to live forever. He has his own island. He's a fucking billionaire. Um, but yeah, like that level of that, the being able to take someone down that path, like I think you do have an inherent yeah. responsibility. Um, but yeah, kind of rolling back. So, 
the emotional tides that you take people through like are really significant. Um, and so like, but knowing when to play off them is, is really important. Okay. So like some of the common things that I see that are done really poorly in sales processes, um, you know, kind of going to some of those more advanced things are like people at the beginning is like setting a framework of like trying to instill like an authority in themselves in the beginning sure. is completely wrong. Okay. Right. Like if you're in a teaching environment, you can do that, but this isn't a teaching environment. This is a sales environment. So a lot of times people start calls with like, Oh, Hey Pat. So the point of today's call is we're going to kind of go through a few things, see, you know, if what we do would work for you. And at the end of that call, I'm going to ask you to make a decision. It's okay if you say yes or no, but I would ask that you make a decision. Is that okay with you? Mm. Now that sounds fine coming off and you can say that in many different ways, but that means that like I'm, one, you could say whatever you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like there's, maybe. Like there's, you can go maybe like that. And if anyone ever does that to me on the sales call, it's exactly what I say at the end. Like, oh, maybe. I'll have a think about it. And then because a lot of the time, right directly after that is when we have an action taker discount. If you do decide to move forward today, you do get a discount, which will only be available to you today. All right. And I go, prove it. Yeah. Well, we talked about that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah. Prove it. I'll call you back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> see if you don't give me that discount. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do you won't get the sale <laughs> um so yeah so like that's a that's a that's an authority frame setting and a okay. lot of sales trainers and people will, will recommend that and people defend it to the hilt They're like no that's how you establish the tone of the call i was like well is it because like you have like there's a there's a false assumption there that you can actually control someone mm. you can't you can't control them so like they're going to make whatever decision they're going to make and you you have very little input you have much less input into that decision than what people think all you can do is take them down the path mm. that you think gets them to the end the most amount of time but at the end of the day it is 100 percent their decision mm. so if they d they can decide yes no maybe so saying that you have to decide that now it's going to change the context of everything that you know that i'm after an outcome mm. and the outcome is yes or no Mm. so every single answer you give me is going to be contextualized upon that fact which means the scaffolding of your entire relationship is completely skewed towards like i need to keep my cards close to my chest because if you're a real buyer like when you went to buy your home right that, that, like which you live in now the real buyers don't run around each bedroom going like, and this is where we'll sleep. And this is where we'll have the kids. Or you don't go into a car dealership and go, this is the perfect car and it's the right. Because you, you want to keep your cards close to your chest because you know you're going to be sold. So you want the leverage. Mm -hmm. So the way I start a call is, hey, Pat, man, how can I help? Yeah. That's it. Okay. And, so, and then you just wait for me to then. Now, like, likely what I'm going to say is, oh, well, I've been looking into this product. Oh, sweet. What is it that attracted your attention to booking the call then? Okay. Like, what is it specifically about what you saw? Oh, I'm looking for this. Okay. Is there anything else? Cool. All right, man. So, like, what are you currently doing to help yourself exactly what you just said? Mm -hmm. Right? So, it's all, like, conversational, and I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. So, I have a level of curiosity, and it's, like, it's a detached curiosity. It's like, hey, dude, how can I help? Mm -hmm. That's how I start every call. <laughs> like, it's very simple. But it, it's, it's designed to just, I'm open for conversation. I'm not here with an agenda. Yep. Right, because like I, I don't want to put, I don't want to like enforce myself on you. I want to make it about you. Mm. And so if I make it about you, who doesn't love talking about themselves? I have a whole fucking podcast and YouTube channel specifically so I can hear my own voice on a regular <laughs> basis. Right? right, I dream in your voice. I yeah, yeah, so yeah. Much. Congratulations. <laughs> I know when we first met, you said that was a dream of yours. So I'm glad to be yeah. able to fulfill. At least it's the voice you have now, not the voice you had when we first met. Oh, my, with the even you more... You were much bits. more American than... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the rum and coke a hundred times in the mirror. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so... Okay, but so let me explore that a little bit because uh, do you think... Let me play devil's advocate to that, like, setting the... Like, it, it sounds to it, me like... Setting the frame is what's Yeah, well, it sounds to me like maintaining the shock of capture. It's like yeah. you're taking control. Yeah, or that's like exactly right. Or yeah. seizing the initiative, to use another army term, yeah. of like, no, I'm in control of this conversation. I've taken it, and like it, it seems like you're saying to the person, I intend to steer the ship here. Yeah. And to a lot of people, like they're like, oh, wonderful, because I, I don't like steering the ship. But you would get massive room for resistance from people who are like, I'm the captain. I am the captain now. Right. But what, yeah, and the, my, my answer to that is like, who, who are the possibly the two most influential human beings ever to live? I'd say probably Jesus and Socrates. They're mm -hmm. two, two of the most, okay. right? And they didn't do it through that. They did it through a, an extraordinarily clever line of questioning. Mm -hmm. 
right? And it wasn't like, so I can lead a conversation without it seeming like I'm leading the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I can do that through interruptions of like, hey, well, like, sorry, like, what did you mean by that? And I can do it through being the one who asked the question. Okay. And so I would prefer to take a more subtle role as yeah. like, yes, I am the captain. However, like, this is your boat. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm just here to kind of make sure that we go in a general direction. Mm-hmm. Instead of me going like, hey, you're on my boat, motherfucker, and you'll do what I say, because then it's the context of everything changes. Mm. And listen, like, well, I'm one of the few guys in the sales industry, especially in coaching and consulting, that would say, do it this way. But it's big one, but I have way more sales experience than almost everybody in the industry, <laughs> right? I've got mm-hmm. 13 years full time selling. Mm-hmm. The coaching industry is not even that old, really. Yeah. The explosion's been like the last sort of few years. Uh, so most of the guys in it are like in their 20s. Like I was fucking Which is funny, huh? Yeah, right, right. Like I'm like the old guy at 38. Yeah, I've just got you know the guys are like 27, 28 years old. It's like I've been full time selling since you were, when you were in high school. Yeah. Um. So so you're achieving the same thing via a different mechanism. So people who would say, uh, no, you have to set the frame because like that takes control of the conversation, allows you to steer the ship. Yeah. And what you would say is, well, let's I'm, pretend. I I I'm kind of gonna be the ship. Because I'm just going to let them get on it and yeah. I'll take them where I want them to go. They can steer as much as they want, but I'm still going where I want. They're still there, ending up where I want to take there's them. There's lane guards, mm-hmm. right? Like they're throwing the ball, but it's only going to go down this way. Because like the way that I ask questions and because I know exactly what I'm trying to get out of it. It's like, that's the thing, right? For people who don't know their process back to front, that's probably a better way of doing it. Okay. Right. So like for people who aren't that like good I would say, like for the beginner sales rep, yeah, do it that way. Yeah. Because the way I do things is, is an advanced methodology because I know exactly what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. So like if I know that, then I can just, I can go, you talk. Mm-hmm. And I'll just, I would just, whatever you say, I'll pick up on certain parts of it and then ask you questions about that. And then I'll punch you down what I need out of you mm-hmm. based on that. I sold a $27,000 paid in full in the car on Facebook Messenger call the other day. The guy just messaged me and I was like, hey, I got time now. He's like, yeah, sweet. On the way from the gym, by the time I got to the gym, called him when I was in the car on the way out of the gym and then I was taking credit card details as I walked into the office and someone threw me a whiteboard marker and I took the payment. And that was an inner circle platinum plus thing that I sort of made up on the spot in terms of the, the package. Yeah. But like I saw that because it was e- easy for me because like I just know exactly what to do. So I don't yeah. need my script. I don't need anything like that. Um, and I and I knew how to box him into a very specific conversation so I could get it. It was a 21-minute call. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's all because I know the process. So um, what I want to do is, like, I want to give the person a mu- as much freedom as possible, like perceived freedom, mm-hmm. where they can talk about anything they want, but I'm always going to just guide them back here. Yeah. Right? And so for me, that whole sort of frame setting at the beginning was ways for the way that I described it was it's a way for someone who to give themselves the perception of control. Mm-hmm. And if that's what makes you a better sales rep, then do it. Mm-hmm. Because if you feel better, then do it that way. But for me, it's like I just don't feel the need to do that. So it's not wrong. It's just not the best way. It's not the best way because it will just change the context. Like, well, one last thing I want to be seen as is a sales guy. Because okay. as soon as as soon as you think of me as trying to sell you something, every single answer you give is completely out of whack. Okay. Because again, you're guarding your cards. Mm-hmm. If you're a real buyer, if you're not a real buyer, you'll just explode information to me. Mm-hmm. And then I've got to try and catch it and put it together. And that's like non-buyer language is like overt buyer language. Right. If someone's like, this is the greatest thing on the planet. I want to do this. They're always like, yes, I'm 100%. And let me think about it. Bah. And they're fucking out, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, I don't have any money. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Be like, yeah, yeah, I'm fucking 100 in, man. Just like call me tomorrow. We'll fucking bang it in. The the guys who are over enthusiastic, like you have to outpace them and then drop them right back and then get real serious with them and stuff. Okay. Like that. So, um, but but I'm taking them through a very specific process, and so like I need them to have different. I need to I need to invoke different emotion at different time, and like I need to use the the swing of emotion in my, in my behavior. Like you, you can't take someone too high and then drop them down too quick. And you can't take someone too quick and then try and build them up too high. Like there's, there's like stair, a staircase okay. of emotion. So what I try and do is like super neutral in the beginning and just kind of like in just discovery phase. Hey man, how's it going? Like in my, and I 
talk quickly but very upbeat with like a lot of like oh yeah how you going yeah okay yeah like that but not enthusiastic and then from there like when i go into problem i sort of slow down a lot and i'm sort of like oh okay and i let them talk and then i just kind of bring them back on track through like the probing and different questions and then when i go into like once i've discovered the problem then i go into the solution and that's when i get quite bright and happy because like i'm trying to like future pace out what a really good solution would be and i try and get them really 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 high like nice and slow to this like really great future emotional state mm -hmm. And then what I'll do, yeah. You go so when you, you, you've got their problem, that comes from them. You want them yep. to deliver that to you. Yeah. You, but I'll guide them to only the problems that I can solve. Sure. Yeah. Perfect. And then you're listening like, mm -hmm, yes, those are problems. Yeah. And then is there a moment like where you're like, do you pull, you know, assuming it's Zoom, they can see you or, or you know, some other way if it's just voice, you're like, we can fix that. Like is it, is it as I would never say that. Okay, but it's it's as overt as that. You're like, oh, good news. No. Okay. No. So I don't ever I don't want to do that because I that's called so like solution dropping is a bad habit that a lot of sales reps have. Okay. Where they go, oh, that's perfect because that's you know that's sort of like what we do with our clients, and they move on, they do it quite flippantly, and they're like, oh yeah, great, you know what I mean? I'm here for weight loss. Oh yeah, perfect. You know, we help people all the time, stuff like that, right? I never want to do that. Okay, how come? Because. I need that person to beg me for the solution. Mm, okay. All right. Like I want them to, I want them to, they, let, they have to have like a nervous anticipation that I will allow them to solve the problem. Mm. Right. And that's how I create urgency. So I'll never say, okay, yeah, we can fix that. Like never. I'll just go, oh, okay. Is that, is that been going on for a while? Okay. And what kind of impact is that having? Okay. That kind of makes sense. Okay. So like, what would you like out of us? You know, and then I'll go into it, but I'll never be like, oh yeah, I've got that. Because again, that's what a salesperson would say. Okay. You know, hey, I'm looking for a car or leather. Oh, perfect, man. We have a bunch of leather cars. Like, what is it else you're looking for? Like, no, no, no. I don't know. I don't even know if leather exists in cars. Mm. Like that. How important is leather to you? Yeah, why leather? Is it so you can clean? Like, do you have kids? Is it like is that? You know, you know so I, I'm more interested in, like, the specifics of the problem and what kind of and why they want to solve it. And okay. then, and then I'll, so I'll, what, what I want is once I get the problem, I want to know how long has it been a problem? What's causing the problem? Uh, and what kind of impact the problem is having. Okay. Those are kind of the things I really want to find out. And then when, once I get that, then I kind of transition into like the gap question. So like what is the specific gap that they're looking to fill? If you were able to solve that problem, essentially, like what outcome do you want? And then where are you now? So okay. whether it's weight loss or money or even like time, like if you're looking to systemize someone's business, like how much are you working and how much time are you spending with your kids versus how much time do you want? Mm -hmm. I used to get that level of time, like... How much do you work? Sweet. And like, how much do you want to be working? Okay, cool. And then in solution awareness, I'm like, well, what would you do with that extra time? Well, I'd spend it with my kids. And how old are your kids? And they're five and seven. Okay, cool. And so how much time are you spending with your kids right now? This much. And is that quality time? Or are you kind of on the, like on the computer? Okay, so how much real quality time every week are you spending with your children? And then I would like, <laughs> I would map that out to like, days per year Ugh. right and i'll be like okay so you spend about 19 days a year with your kids total they go yeah and i go and kids are you know they're small for a long time right and they go like Ugh. but it's the truth like those motherfuckers yeah. are working 90 hours a week for no reason because they refuse to do things properly mm -hmm. so the the thing that i sold like it literally would have given them like 10 15 hours a week back instantaneously mm -hmm. so it's like if that's your motivator that's your motivator that's what gets you moving and grooving a lot of tradies, for example, like they just go head down, ass up for 30 years, calling themselves a martyr because they do it for their kids when they could just fucking do things a better way mm -hmm. and, and make the same money, <laughs> but just work less hours through like simple systems and not doing invoices 19 times. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I remember I got a fucking thing done at my house a while ago and the dude dropped a handwritten invoice into my mailbox. I was like, bro, <laughs> I was like, how many people pay these? Yeah. He was like, oh, most. I was like, most? I was like, what if you just got a fucking, a square attachment for your phone, for your tap credit card on the day? Done. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, in some industries is like traditionalism, right? Like it's just when you did your apprenticeship, that's what your boss did. Yeah. And if you're not looking elsewhere, you don't know. Yeah. But I just, then what gets me is like, that's a problem though. 
Yeah, yeah. Lack of fulfilling invoices, time, manual effort. Like that's all time and, and effort and emotional energy that you're spending. Like look for a fucking solution. So let's know. stick with that as a like specific example. So that's a lack of problem awareness, right? Yeah. That that's just the correct what, category to put that into. Yeah. So I, I would I would be able to pull that out of somebody and then tie that back to a solution. Like, what impact is that having? And some people just never think of the impact. Mm. Like, I remember, like, oh, oh fucking, I'll oh, thank Stu, our, our mutual friend in physio, right? I go, fuck, man, my ankles are so shit from the army. And he goes, they hurt because you're fat. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> he goes, bro, you are fat as fuck. And that's why your ankles hurt. And I was like, why did no one tell me? <laughs> my wife is like you're so beautiful she's just got like fucking love heart eyes I can't trust her she's like you look great baby I'm like yeah, yeah. fuck you I love you the way I that you great spill great out of your clothes yeah <laughs> she thinks you look great all the time like that um, but like you could put her in a lie detector she generally does like she just you know so they hurt because you're fat yeah and I was like really he's like yeah bro like you don't need reconstructive you don't need this like yeah you have shit ankles but they just wouldn't hurt if you were fat I lost 20 kilos it stopped hurting mm. You know, and it wasn't until someone like I was aware of my problem, like my ankles hurt, but I I had just oh well that's a problem that can only be fixed with surgery. Yeah, and I'd gone okay. into the surgeons and they were like, yeah, your ankles are fucked. It wasn't until someone told me the truth and went, it's because you're fat, mm -hmm. and I went, oh, that's I can fix that. Mm -hmm. I can fix that, and now I have the correct motivation to do so, and it the mirror was held up. So yeah. like everyone's got blind spots. I think for me and you both, our our body is a blind spot, right? <laughs> reflection perfection no matter what state we're in right <laughs> i'm so, aware yeah I just the, it's just hard but i think when you can attach a specific problem to it yeah like if your back started to fuck out and your physio was like lose 10 kilos your back won't be fine you fucking lose 10 kilos yeah it's, like, it's, like, that's that. exactly what happens for me yeah I, I blow out to a point where i'm like <laughs> oh the pain's back yeah i know how to fix this and like now like i'm getting heavier but it's because i'm building muscle and like nothing hurts yeah like, I know because I'm 103. I was 103 about four months ago, but mm -hmm. I was fat and everything hurt. Now I'm 103, nothing hurts. Mm -hmm. And it's because I've been putting on muscle. So it's like, oh, sweet. Like, I'm, I'm cool with that. And so I think, like, a lot of the time people need that mirror and they need to be told. And, like, I love doing that. Mm. I really enjoy that part of the job is, like, that's the problem, man. Like, you need to solve. And even if they don't go away and solve it, like, with me, at least they now are thinking, that's the, okay, sweet. That's a real significant thing. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not spending time with my kids because I do all these fucking stupid things. Do you think that's like a core motivator for you? Like why you've become so successful at this is that you enjoy that piece of it so much that like as that's your process as much as the actual selling. Like you enjoy that interaction with people. I think so. I like, um, it's funny. Like I was traditionally, I think very bad at difficult conversations in my personal life, mm -hmm. but I was very good at very confrontational conversations with strangers. Mm. Um, always like, you know, someone cuts in line. i like, Hey buddy, what are you doing? Mm. Like I'll always do that. I've always done that. Mm -hmm. Even when I was like 11, mm. like, get the fucking back in the line. I'm the opposite. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. You have... You I don't, like, uh, I'm not afraid of them or anything, but I just would choose not to. Like, because yeah. I just sort of, I'm like, I don't care about you. Like, you'd... you'd but but for people I care about... Yeah, like, I would say... You know, you, I'm yeah. often... Yeah. <laughs> You're the I'm sage. Often yeah. referred to as, like, the awkward truth teller. Yeah. But because I'm like... Like when Seth was like, is my kid ugly? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's because, like, with my friends and family, I'm like, I... I I love you enough to tell you the truth about this. Yeah. And I would expect that you'd do the same to so me. So I think I was the opposite for a long time. And then like, as I got better and better at doing it in sales, I got much more comfortable with having those conversations with family members. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I've had, uh, you know, I've had many conversations with family members over the last couple of years, which is like, Hey, I think this is a problem. Like, mm -hmm. I think you should probably fix it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they take it well, sometimes they don't like whatever, as long as it's delivered caringly, I think that's important, but I do really enjoy that side. And like, if I can walk away with like, Oh, like I generally, even if they didn't buy, like I really don't care, but it's like, if I, if I was able to show someone like, that's a real serious problem that you should probably consider fixing. Yeah. Um, then like, that's a win. Yeah. Perfect. You know? So that's good. Um, but as I, as I sort of, as we go through that problem, like then once we've established the problem, then we establish like what solving the problem would give. And that's through those specific gap questions that we talked about earlier. I get the real story. Then I get an initial gap. Then from there we go, okay, like what does filling that gap give you? Okay. And what we're trying to do is get a tangible and emotional. So like I would get to, I would get to 50 K or say like 300 K a year, 300 K a year allows me to do this. Doing this allows me to feel like this. Mm -hmm. 
because like what money doesn't mean much, mm -hmm. you know, it's what you can do with it. That, yeah, you know, totally. You know, so like if you're able to, you know, a lot of times it's like, oh, I'd love to buy my family the dream holiday or the dream house or get a better car or, you know, travel, whatever it may be. And so what you want to do is you want to find out like the specifics of that, because when people talk about specifics, sometimes for the first time, they're truly understanding like the, like what it feels like to actually think about it. Okay. Like, I don't know if you do, but like I think about my goals and I like try and tangibly like, what would that be like? Mm -hmm. You know, like, and so, okay. So you don't just imagine the heading. You've got the paragraphs under the heading mm -hmm. and like, it's the detail, right? So yeah. I remember like I had this, I had this guy once and he was like, um, it was just a young dude. I was on sales training. So it wasn't like, he was like, you know, 23. It's not like he has some sort of impactful thing with family and kids. And he's like, I really want to go traveling. I was like, oh, where do you want to travel? He's like, I'd love to go to Greece. I was like, oh, where in Greece? He's like, Santorini. I was like, why Santorini? He's like, oh, it's beautiful. And it's got the white cliffs. I was like, yeah, yeah, they got the cliffs and the thing. And I was like, yeah, cool, man. I was like, who would you take? And he's like, oh, my girlfriend. I was like, sweet. And like, where would you stay? Have you researched? And he was like, yeah, I have. And I was like, what's the hotel called? He was like this. And I was like, which room would you get? And he's like, I get this room. And then they start looking up. And they're like, ah. Oh. And I'm like, what's the first photo you'd take? Like, what's the Instagram? Mm. Like, like, what is it? And he's like, oh, man, I have this. And I have my girlfriend. And I have this behind me in the fucking white cliffs. And I was like, yeah, it'd be dope, man. And I was like, what would it be like if you were able to, like, call your girlfriend right now and be like, hey, baby, I just booked us a trip to Santorini. He was like, oh, man, that'd be amazing. And I'd be like, yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's the feeling. It's not the money. Yeah. It's being able to do that. And then so, like, what I'll do is, like, okay, man. And then, like, so now I've built him up, like, really, like, visualized, built him up. And now now I need to bring him down here real low. But if I do that too quick, it'll fuck it up. Okay. Right? Like, it's too much of a swing. So I try and bring him down back to reality. So i got to go future, reality, uh, negative future. So positive future, reality, negative future. Okay. If I go straight to negative future, then he'll, he won't believe that he can't do it. Right. So if I go, well, what happens if you never figure out how to, how to take your missus? He's like, no, I'll figure it out. You know why? Because he's in a really positive state. Uh huh. So I can't do that. And that's the mistake a lot of sales guys make. Like the most sales guys make that mistake. They try and like use the shift, mm -hmm. but it'll work against you because if you've done a good job of building up their still positivity, that high. they're still riding the high. So I go, okay, man, like with, um, like with the, I guess the sales skills and you know, the opportunities and stuff that you have now, like how close are you to making that phone call? And they'll just go, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not close. That's reality. Okay. Right. And then I'll go, well, well, like, why not? And I'll make them explain it. So, like, there you can see, like, the the dead, like, the life in their eyes drain a little bit, <laughs> right? But so, but it's very intentional. So, like, because I need to, I need to bring them back to reality because I have to remind them of what, like, reality is. Otherwise, yeah. like, people don't. Because they'll buy from that place. They're buying from a place of reality, not, like, yeah. they need to be thinking about what can be. But if their mind is there, they can't be buying. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of people just which is again, I think a, a fault of or like a good, a, a really positive trait in humanity. Like they don't, people don't really think about the worst case. They mm -hmm. don't, they don't consider it. But like, uh, I say this a lot in sales. It's like, there's a difference between someone who runs a hundred meters and someone who runs out of a burning building. Mm -hmm. Like there's a different <laughs> level of veracity. And it's because it's, and it's, you know, like one of the analogies I use all the time is actually like, if someone is not getting it, if they're like, no, 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 I'm going to do it no matter what. And I'm like, okay, okay. If you have a deer and a bear, Mm. right and bears delicious like kind of eating little things little grass and it's fucking big bear sees this thing he's like oh, i'm gonna eat the fuck out of that deer and the bear starts running snaps a twig deer sees it fucking takes off and now they're both running what animal gives up first the bear why because there's other things he can eat exactly. he can eat some berries exactly the deer it's life and death and it's and it's not that the deer is like, oh, I should probably run away because it would be unfortunate. It's because, like, it's probably seen its fucking cousin or mother had its fucking throat ripped out and <laughs> devoured by a bear. <laughs> like, there is a there is a level of, like, even if they haven't seen it, they know that's what's going to happen. There's, like, a level of, like, internal terrified visualization of, like, I do not want that to happen. I, I actually know the real answer for this. I can tell you later. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can say it now. Yeah, you say it now. Well, the way it works, and this is pretty interesting, um... 
it's not relevant to sales at all, sorry, is that when you're born, there's these three different genes that get expressed. And what happens during the expression of those genes is things become normalized. So humans have the longest expression of those genes. And in fact, there's a particular, um, I can't remember what it's called, but the people are very often who have it, uh, they, it never stops expressing and they're often referred to as like the drunk idiot as a, at a party. Like everyone's their best friend, right? And yeah, they right. meet you and within minutes, they're your best friend. And, and it carries a lot of learning difficult uh, disabilities. It's quite sad. Um, but so those genes are expressed. And when they stop being expressed, what happens after that, what, if you don't experience it during that time, it's not normal and you should be scared of it. And okay. so dogs express that gene for th- those three genes for 16 weeks. And so anything you experience in that time is normal. Hence the socialization and stuff like that. Critical period. It, so it's called the critical period of socialization that exists in all animals. In a deer, they use deer as the, the test case, actually, because it's two hours. Oh, so, wow. So, yeah, a deer gets that. They're scared of everything. Well, that's, that's the idea. So the deer is born and he goes, I see my mum. She's a deer. That's a normal thing. I see the woods. This is all normal. And then two hours later, if it hasn't experienced it in those two hours, it's scared to death of it. Yeah, right. and, 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 and anything <laughs> that it sees is like, oh, I'm terrified of that. Not because I've had an experience or have any reason to be scared of it, other than that I didn't exper- experience it during my critical period of socialization, which with a deer is two hours. Yeah. So like, and they have these demos of this where they get a, like a, a very satiated lion and they put it at the deer at its birth and the deer goes lions are normal and that deer will, <laughs> <laughs> that deer will never run from a lion yeah, like, what's going on yeah and when that lion gets hungry right yeah, yeah. Or, or that deer it encounters another lion that ain't hungry yeah yeah it's a bad ending well, anyway my story is <laughs> way more effective for sales <laughs> you know that's a rule though never let the truth get in the way of a good story no no, no. so <laughs> anyway so what happens when a deer right <laughs> So, uh, like, I try and create that visualization. It's like yeah. it's like it's like when people at nine eleven jumped out of the building. Mm-hmm. It's like I might survive that fall. Mm-hmm. I'm definitely burning to death. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, like, there's just a motivation, and I think a lot of the times when you see people like an Elon Musk or someone who's like hyper successful, they're running towards and also running away. So yeah. they have an outcome, but like they're running away from this burning building that you don't know what it is. Maybe it's a uh, when they were, you know, like I think like what is it, like two to seven formative years of when you figure out who you are and how mm-hmm. you're perceived by humans. So if you were laughed at considerably between two and seven, you assume everyone's laughing at you. Mm-hmm. So you, you might be like just trying to outrun the laughter, mm-hmm. which is what I assume Bezos is doing. Yeah. Right. Because that guy would have been mercilessly bullied as a kid. Yeah. So, I mean, being a bold 40 year old old man at fucking at t- 10 is not good. <laughs> so, <laughs> but like, so, so they're, they're sort of running away from that stuff and, um, so there's two levels of motivation, I think. So for people to, to really kind of hit their stride, they, and to really achieve, I think like great things, um, I think they need both. Yeah, for sure. Right. You know? And so if people are not willing to explore the negative, then I'll sort of take them through that process mm-hmm. to then have them flip to go, Oh, it now benefits me mm-hmm. to explore the negative. So I bring them back to reality we kind of explain why it's not possible with what they currently have. And then we talk about, well, what happens if if that never changes, if you're never put in a position to where you can succeed. Mm -hmm. And then we go through what are the day-to-day ramifications of nothing changing? Because Mm -hmm. the problems will only exacerbate, they'll only get worse. And so I want to, we want to explore, now we've explored the positive, we've explored reality, now we've got to explore the negative. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's that juxtaposition yeah. Right. Of, of like, okay, fuck. I've now possibly for the first time really in depth and in detail thought about what happens if I succeed mm-hmm. because people just don't think about it. Yeah. You know, um, probably not in that minutia level that you're dragging, dragging them into. Yeah. And, it, and it, it is the minutia that puts them there. They become in like an associative state, you know, those dissociative and associative states. So they're thinking about it in an associative way. They're there. And so they're having the feeling that they would be having if they were there, mm-hmm. not having the feeling of what it might be like to be there. Mm-hmm. So it's much more powerful. And then by taking them back to reality and then taking them into the negative, like there's a natural emotional progression. And so I've created, like, and I try and do that as, I try and do that, that negative. I don't try and stay there for too long because they, they need to have confidence in their ability to get there in order to buy. Mm-hmm. So if you build, so you don't crush them. if you build too big a gap, then 
you take them outside of a pocket that they're going to buy from, mm. you know, emotionally. And so, but if I take them down too quickly, they won't believe the negative is even possible. And then you've got to fight them on that. And then it becomes more combative. So having that process. And then from there, I really quickly transition into my presentation. And my presentation is really short. Yeah. And it's short because I've created this enormous, like, tidal wave of, like, conflicting emotions, which is transition, which translates into urgency. So, so all of this is before you've even made them an offer. Like oh, yeah, they yeah. don't even know what the fuck you're telling them at this point. Yeah, yeah no, they have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I do the price first. Okay. So they know that a certain outlay can solve their problem, perhaps. Well, so as soon as I take them negative. I oh, go that's my, when you go to price, right? Yeah, okay. so I'll go, okay, well, based off what you told me, I think that what we do might work. And they go, oh, really? I go, Yeah. With your permission, I'll, I'll take you through what, what I think we can do to help solve the problems mm -hmm. and get you to XYZ. And they go, yeah, sweet. I go, it's 30 grand over six months. And for that, this is what we'll do for you. Price first. Yeah, that's how I do it. The reason why that's how I do it, which is antithetical to everything in sales, mm -hmm. including Jeremy. He doesn't do that? No, he thinks it's stupid. But I'll tell you why I like it. Okay. <laughs> right? It's because that's how I like being sold. Right. So... Um, if I, I hate going to a car dealership where they don't have the sticker price. Yeah. Because I want to know if I can afford the car. I don't want to talk about things that I can't afford. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, I would only present them with one offer, but I probably have three offers available to me. Okay. So I only present the one that's within the price bracket that I think is appropriate to them based on the information that I've gathered. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to present a $100,000 offer to a guy making five grand a month. It's okay. just, I'm not going to do it. So if you go, it's 30 grand and they go, what? Do you then go, it's 15 grand? <laughs> or No. Um, I'll almost always default to the middle option. Yeah. Unless I know they probably need the bigger one. Okay. So I, I generally like experience means I don't present the wrong one. Yeah. Um, which makes it hard if you only have one offer. But then, like, you usually do a pre-qualification call, which you would get some more specifics. So yep. you should have enough information. To, and, you, you you know, and if they don't have the money, they don't have the money. Fuck it. Yeah, yeah. Just go for it and see what you can do. Um, so I'll, I'll say the price first, and that's because, like, I want to present the price when they're at their most emotional because I know, like, every minute that goes by from that big drop, you know, that sort of stage drop, mm -hmm. I'm losing urgency. Okay. So sure. people who have 30 minute presentations. Yeah. It's like all that hard work that you've done is now gone. It's unraveled. You know? Um, so I've got to like, you know, it's sort of like disciplining a dog. Like you got to do it there and then. Mm -hmm. You can't do it 10 minutes later. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't reference back. Well, he, humans are the same. So I want to go bang. And then my pitch is laid out with like, here's the price. Here's what we do for you. And then it's like, here's what we do. Here's why we do it. And here's a specific problem it solves for you, which links back to them. Mm -hmm. And then from there, like my presentation is only designed to get buy-in that it would work, not to get a yes. Okay. That's not it. Um, and they have to say that it would work knowing the price. The problem is if you do the price at the end, people go, so what we do for you is we do this and then this and then this. Does that all make sense? Yep. And do you feel like that could work for you? You know, and they go through all that stuff and they're like, yeah, but what does it cost? Mm -hmm. And then I've got to try and like kind of reestablish value so I can present price. Yeah, I just okay. go like, here's Here the price. That makes sense. Yeah, for me it's easier because like I, I hate being pitched and getting a 10 minute long presentation and they go, does that work for you? I'm like, only if it's in my budget. Yeah. Because like I have a $30,000 problem. If it's a $60,000 solution, I'm not interested. Yeah. You know, so it's got to be irrelevant to the problem that I have. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, like I've, I've got to kind of, I like to present it that I'm just more comfortable doing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, like I try and make it like a f three to four minute pitch, like really, really quick. Mm -hmm. So that when I ask that, it's like I can, I'm using all the tidal wave emotion that I've got. Yeah. Um, and it just seems to work out. Yeah. yeah. Evidently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those nan lights ain't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I like that. We're out of time, but yeah. I, uh, that was... I feel like I picked up some... Um, Picking up what I'm putting down? Some amazing little tidbits there. Yeah. I'm excited. If you guys like this content, make sure you keep watching. Comment down below if you want us to do more of this sort of yeah. nitty-gritty sales stuff. And let us know in the comments below because we're actually pulling a lot of the content that we're getting these days mm -hmm. from the comments. Yes. So if you guys want to hear anything specifically, um, let us know. Yep. Let me know. I read all the comments. We check on everything. 
see what uh, where to steer the ship. Yeah, like, subscribe, hit notification, but all that kind of good stuff. And thank you very much. Goodbye. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Ha <laughs> ha.